Uh, I am uh, Dr. Heather Colgordi, and I am the co-director of the Initiative for Indigenous, no, I'm not. I am co-director of the <laughs> Indigenous Futures Cluster. <laughs> uh, Jason Lewis is co-director of the Initiative for Indigenous Futures, and I'm very happy to welcome you here tonight. Uh, this is an event that's put on in partnership with the Department of Art History as well. I would like to begin by acknowledging that Concordia University is located on in unceded indigenous lands. The Gayangaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Tijoge, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. And that is Concordia's recently adopted um, new <coughs> land acknowledgement. If you want to learn more about it, we have a, a great website where um, uh, local members of the Indigenous Directions Leadership Group, spearheaded by one of our Honestoni uh, PhD students, wrote this. And then you can also look at it, and it will give you a, you can, uh, there's a drop-down menu where you can get a breakdown of what, uh, what the significance of each sentence is and what each part that means. It's my distinct pleasure tonight to introduce Ryan McMahon, our guest of honor. Ryan is a Anishinaabe comedian, writer, media maker, and community activator from the uh, Kwichin First Nation and Treaty 3 territory. Recognized as Indian country's most decorated stand-up comedian, Ryan has recorded five national comedy specials since 2010, appeared at the prestigious Just for Laughs Festival a, a number of times, right here, and later this year is showcasing for HBO as, as a reverent, forward-looking, and challenging brand of comedy spreads around the world. Ryan has written for the Globe and Mail, Vice, New York Times, and CBC. Ryan has just completed his first book, The Great Indian Paradox, uh, published under Arsenal Pump Pre uh, Pulp Press and Robin's Ed Books, and is currently shopping his second book, 20, 2167, Future Reason, Border Country, a seriously funny investigation into the next 150 years of Canada. It's McMahon's media work that has cemented his place in the current political social discourse on reconciliation in Canada and the collision between Indian country and the mainstream. He's the CEO of the McCombs Media Group and is currently building the world's only independent indi indigenous media platform committed to digital publishing and the internet. Please join me in welcoming Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Do I start when it starts, or? <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> Good. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for coming uh, here this evening and uh, taking time out of your schedule to um, uh, share this time and space with, uh, with us. I hope to present um, for around 40 minutes and then uh, uh, have a, a conversation about some of, uh, some of the presentation and maybe take questions and, and comments. Um, so we should be out of here by, by 7.30 or so. Uh, I want to uh, first say uh, thank you for the invitation uh, into, into the space here today um, and, and um, acknowledge the, the work that I, I was a fan of Jason Lewis and Scavenati long before uh, I ever got to meet you and gave them award, an award at the Imaginative Film Festival. Uh, so I was a fan before uh, I was uh, up here in this space. So I want to say thank you to both of you for the invitation. And I uh, thank you to uh, all of the students and all of the people behind the scenes at work to, to make this, uh, this happen uh, over the last couple of days. Um, <coughs> I'm, I'm always inspired to come back to this territory and um, this is a territory that has long inspired uh, so many people in so many different ways. And to be here uh, in, in uh, Montreal and, and kind of uh, earlier today we we're talking about the Gunawage Survival School and a lot of the work that has happened uh, on the other side of the river uh, in response to this place existing. And uh, so it's always inspiring to be here and to kind of think about how that um, we can take that story and um, uh, inspire ourselves with, with all of that work that, that happens here in, in Montreal. Um, <coughs> we're going we're to talk about reconciliation because that's, that's the time we're in. That's what we're talking about, all everywhere, all over. Because Justin Trudeau said it's time to, to <laughs> reconcile, to just move forward and just do it. Just 
let's just grab random indigenous elders by the shoulders and stare deeply, <laughs> deeply into their eyes. Just let's give Carolyn Bennett another, another native scarf. Let's give her a, another scarf and, and have Perry Bellegarde talk about closing the gap. Clo we got to close the gap. So we're closing gaps and giving scarves and staring at elders and we're moving to, to, to this new town called, you know, Reconciliationville, population you and me, <laughs> with, the, with the mayor <laughs> being Justin Trudeau. Uh, and let's never forget that little asshole was probably in the room during the crafting of the white paper. <laughs> so, let's be on guard. Um, <coughs> uh, we're in a time that I don't think we, um, that, uh, I don't think most of us ever imagined being in um, a time where we're, we're actually uh, looking at, you know, fundamentally shifting um, uh, our, our, our indi the indigenous reality in this country, and we're looking at it from sort of all points of view. Art is, is doing it, music is doing it, our politicians now are starting to think more deeply about what it means uh, when we talk about nationhood and other things, so it's this this sort of re-emerging of this, this, uh, this space that, that we find ourselves in today that f for me a, as um, a 41 year old that grew up in a time where our chiefs back home in Treaty 3 talked about uh, blowing up the Trans-Canada Highway and cutting off the railway system in Canada to bring Canada to its knees economically. Uh, if anyone from CSIS is here, it's nice to see you again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to bring this country to a standstill economically so that the Indian question is actually dealt with. That, that's the, those are the politics I grew up hearing in the early and mid-90s uh, when I was a young person engaged in being in youth councils and youth, youth planning in my community. Um, <coughs> and then that, that conversation starts to shift a little bit and, and we start talking about you know, needing to work with Canada as partners and, and, and kind of being stuck in this relationship and then it, it sort of evolves Oka uh, is, is behind us, dances with wolves, <laughs> is, is, <laughs> is right beside us. And, <laughs> and, uh, and so we start, we start to, 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 to see this future start to emerge. And, and, and in m for my people in my territory in Treaty 3, at Kuchiching First Nation, it was certainly in the late 90s where we started to work more closely with the Grand Council of Treaty 3 to look at what it means to call ourselves Anishinaabe in Treaty 3 and how how we uh, sort of assert uh, ourselves in, in our territory. And, um, and I remember those times. I remember being terrified at youth council meetings, listening to some, these chiefs talk about blowing up the Trans-Canada Highway, digging up the Trans-Canada Highway, thinking like, I, I, get, I guess this is what it, we're doing. This is like what we have to do. And being, be leaving these meetings feeling so uh, afraid you know, of, of that option being on the table. Um, and now here we are, you know, there's checks, checks floating around, the, the, the <laughs> times have changed and we're indigenizing everything and the, which is not, not what we're going to talk about tonight, but I'm going to digress a little bit just to say stop indigenizing everything um, and just give us our land back. And then, um, and then <laughs> we'll build our own universities on our own land. And we all live happy, happily ever after. But um, what I want to talk about um, tonight um, is, is, uh, is the fifth uh, season of my podcast, Red Man Laughing, which um, <coughs> because of the work of the TRC and because I come from um, my family members, I come from a long line of, of residential school survivors. I spent a lot of time uh, in my, my practice um, through comedy and writing you know, rejecting the system and being angry and not having a place really to put that, that anger and not really knowing how to work through it. And so I decided um, in 2015 that if I was going to be angry all the time and if I was going to sort of reject the Canadian state that I, I needed to do something healthier with, with all of what was going on in my head and decided to turn the microphone on myself a little bit and, uh, <coughs> and work through season five of my podcast, which was um, dedicated to, we're going to talk <laughs> a little bit about these, um, but we're going to talk a little bit about um, 
the 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 path of of season five of the podcast and sort of where where I began at the start of the season and where where I ended and and sort of the journey therein. And um, when I started um, season five of the podcast, I remember I had um, just published this this rant on, on my podcast, basically. Uh, uh, a day after Sir John A. Macdonald's 250th birthday, there were celebrations across the country, uh, large op-eds in the Globe and Mail celebrating this man and then problematizing a, a little bit who this gentleman was and I basically just released a rant saying, fuck this guy, um, I'm not interested in, in the celebration and why, why, do we keep, why do we keep these settler myths, these, these, these settler myths that, that are, are so um, deeply enriched in the Canadian psyche, why do we, we keep these balls in the air when we have so much other work to do? And, uh, and so I, I, I released this, uh, this episode of my podcast and I got a lot of feedback with people saying like, you know, you know are you okay? <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, what, what's actually going on? Um, and I, I didn't really realize how m angry, like how angry I had become. I didn't really realize how impatient I had become and how really out of balance um, uh, I had become with, with this conversation. And, um, and it was a friend of mine that said, you know, you need a healthy place, you need a healthier place to put this stuff. And, um, and hence um, season, season five of the podcast began. This is also the work, um, the work at the time the TRC had just completed um, uh, its sort of its halfway point. They had released their, their um, uh, I forget, what, what was the actual title of the document, I forget. Um, but they had reached the, the middle of their work. I don't have words right now. <laughs> words aren't working in my <laughs> brain. Yeah, well, it wasn't the summary. It was like they'd reached, a ha anyway, they reached the halfway point of their, of their work and they released a, a, an interim report. And, um, and then I read it. And I, I read it in like two days. And, I, and um, my grandfather uh, was, was ill. And, um, and I was really thinking deeply about like, um, like when we think about reconciliation, we always think about it like outside of us. Like it's, when I think about reconciliation, I think about what people are doing out there. Like where the resources are going in this reconciliation industry that is emerging. Like I, and I, I get stuck there. And I don't think about what's going on here. And so at that time when I read the, the, execu the summary, um, I started to think about uh, my family and, and, and think about what I'm actually practicing in terms of reconciliation and what it means to be in a family with, uh, surrounded by residential school survivors. What am I doing to support them? What am I doing to reconcile inside of our own family? And it uh, turns out not much, right? Um, and any Indigenous person in this room can probably uh, agree, you probably have those family members you can't stand and you don't care to ever see again. And, and I'm f we have lots of those in my family, it turns out. And, and I wanted to kind of think about how we could bring our family back together and look at some of this stuff. And it was, it was that interim report that got me thinking more about family being the cornerstone of, of what I think is, is, um, is and will be the revolution. It'll be family. Um, rebuilding family to me is, is far more important than considering who the next Prime Minister is and uh, what, what, you know, um, what, what the Grand Chief is saying publicly, you know, in the media, it's, it's, it's family and we, we can very easily look at, you know, um, the child welfare system, we can look at residential schools, I, I mean, what is more cowardly an act than um, targeting uh, children? families as, as residential schools did. So started to think about, well, family has to be front and center in, inside of the reconciliation movement that I want to be a part of. And if that's true, then my family and I, we have, you know, we have a lot of work to do. And that work I did publicly um, on the podcast. I'm going to skip a lot of this stuff. Um, that work I did, I did publicly on the podcast through I believe it was 21 episodes uh, of the podcast and I started to think about like, like so many people in our family uh, and in, in my community, we had just not talked, we had not um, carefully considered each other's experiences as, they re as we relate to each other. And, and, and that was across, that spanned decades. 
where f our family members were just kind of uh, broken up. I have family in Minnesota that we haven't seen um, since the 90s, since the early 90s. And it, it's, just, it's just that way for our family. And, um, and somebody sent me this quote one time. Uh, I wasn't, I, you know, I didn't know why. Um, and it's an Orwell quote from 1984. And I, when I started to look at the quote, I, I just thought, well, it's pretty simple. Like it's, for me, that's, you know, probably, for me, it's decolonization. Like this is a political quote. And, and for me, it's about um, taking back taking back control of our past for ourselves and our family, taking control of the narrative. What are, what are the stories we tell ourselves? Stories are very powerful. And the stories that we tell ourselves become, often become our, our, our reality. And so the stories that my family and my community uh, was telling itself were very, very unhealthy. And I started to look at that, well, if, if we allow them or, or they or the white man or the government, however we frame it, if we allow them to control our present, like control what we are thinking now, they will not only control the past but, but, but the future as well. But I wanted to sort of work with that and I rewrote it. Um, they, because it's not all about us, gentlemen, they uh, who control the past uh, control the future, they who control the present control the past, and then finally they who control the future understands their past and our present. And I added this last line kind of on a personal reflection of like, that's what we need to do. We need to wrestle with what is behind us in order to understand what is in front of us. And for me, being present is the greatest gift we can give each other, time. And it's a resource and, and, and something that you can't go and buy at Walmart. Uh, you can't get time back. You can't get more time in the day. Time is, is finite, and so time is of the, the essence. And what a great, what, what, what more great a gift uh, to give each other than, than, than time. And, and so <coughs> I really wanted to, through the, the, the season of the podcast, really think about like how and what kind of time we give each other. And, and what, what, what does that space that we build for each other, you know, really look like? And we started to wrestle with some of these questions through some of the episodes. I'm going to jump through some of these slides a little bit. Um, <coughs> and I'll go back to some of them uh, in a second. But we started to wrestle with the question of time and space uh, as it relates to reconciliation through uh, many of these episodes. And if anyone's listened to the podcast, you'll know what I'm referring to here. The Oneman Collective, Christy Belcourt and uh, Isaac Murdoch, um, just set out on their own to create a safe space to make art and to, to center indigenous languages um, and to give young people the time and the space to do so. And today, uh, through uh, just in intense effort of fundraising uh, for themselves and selling art and, and hosting events, they went and bought a piece of land uh, out outside of uh, Sudbury. And, uh, and they have a camp. They have a, a language immersion camp. And, and that was, um, to me, like a profound act of love and, and courage, where they just said, well, you know, we, we, we need to raise $75,000 for this parcel of land, and we don't know how to do it, but we can make things, and we can sell things, so let's try that. And they did. And probably many of you supported that, either through purchasing t-shirts or prints. And they just went and did it. And then from the ground up, built this beautiful uh, camp. And um, the 4Rs um, youth movement is, is a multicultural youth movement through, through Canada that build space for youth to come in and, and learn from each other. Another beautiful, profound act of love where all of these youth can sit together and make mistakes, have awkward conversations. There's no wrong answer. There's no dumb question. Just really building this beautiful, uh, beautiful space. And, and, and through <coughs> the early episodes uh, of the podcast uh, in this season, um, a couple of things started to emerge, a couple of main messages. Uh, love. Love is at the core of everything. I went into this thinking about the politics, nationhood, you know, getting land returned to indigenous peoples. Like, I went into this just squarely thinking of the politics. And through um, the first few episodes, Christy Belcourt talked about giving gifts. You, we just have to keep giving. We have to keep giving. The more we give, the more we'll get back. The more we give, the more. And I, and I was like, You're cr this is, that's insane. <laughs> We've given too much. 
All we do is give. That's all we've ever done, to a fault, some would say. We've just given, given. And she said, yeah, and that's what we have to continue to do. And if you listen to that episode, uh, uh, episode one of season five, I, I, I say that. This is preposterous. This is, I'm not down with that. We have to stop giving and start taking our lives back. We have to, so I, re I reject the premise outright. But through uh, many episodes, this, this theme kept coming up. We, we have to continue to give, um, which was really interesting. We'll touch on that uh, in a little bit. Then something kind of uh, funny happens where um, we start to look at uh, Lee Miracle and Dr. Marie Wilson fight on the panel in this episode. <laughs> and like our, our fundament, not opposed, but our old friends, but have very different ideas. Some, Lee is I think a little more radical in her thinking, Dr. Marie Wilson certainly as, as one of the um, chairs of the TRC sort of is more open to navigating the system and, and, and kind of working from within it. And in that, in that um, disagreement that they have in the, in the episode, um, it, it, it was like, it was, it was really awkward because then I was like, well, you s are you going to sign the waiver so we can publish it? <laughs> because it's a public, you know, dis fundamental disagreement um, that, that they have. And, um, and I thought that they would want to protect themselves. You know, they, th they both have fairly high profiles. And uh, I thought that there was no way they would allow uh, me to publish it. But then they said, of course, like, we, this is what it's actually about. We can't be afraid of disagreeing. We can't all just get along and close our eyes and hope this reconciliation shit works out because we're not going to get a do-over. Those are Lee Miracle's words. We're not going to get a do-over. We're not going to go down this path of reconciliation, whatever it is or isn't, and, and five or ten years from now go, well, <laughs> we made, let's go, we have to go back. Sorry, guys. Come on, come on. No, no. If, uh, ser no, I'm serious. Everyone, let's go. We're not going to get a do-over. And I thought that that was really interesting. And so, you know, showing the warts and all um, inside of that episode was, was really fascinating. We weren't, I was willing to protect them and not release that episode and not release the conversation, but they, they were really adamant that this is what the, the work is actually about. Um, if there's one thing I can ask you to do when you leave here, if, uh, if there is one thing, I invite you li to listen to uh, Elder Dave Crochane and his talk on nationhood. It is, it is so, um, it, it's, it, it is such a powerful expression of, of what it means uh, for me in, in terms of, of, of reconciliation and nationhood and how it, how it, he very succinctly and very carefully sort of pulls at the, the, the fringes of, of this reconciliation conversation in terms of programs and services. Sort of that's, that's what we're seeing is like there's this massive influx of programs and services and uh, all these checks are being written and the industry is emerging and there's consultants and reconciliation experts and, uh, and the voices that are being centered in this industry are, are uh, it's very interesting to look at which voices are being privileged here inside of that space. And Elder Corshane very carefully uh, pulls at those threads and, and completely dismantles this, this concept of reconciliation. So as to say it's not this public facing thing. And in fact, um, who gives a shit what white people think? And I was like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> now, I see <laughs> some white people sat up. <laughs> well, we'll just wait here. <laughs> it's an interesting uh, idea. And again, it felt dangerous when he was talking like that. Because, you know, we have this, we have this idea that, that we're all in, that, that, this that we're, we're creating a new status quo day by day. And there's no, like, reconciliation handbook. There's no reconciliation for dummies, right? <laughs> Though that's a hell of a book idea right there. <laughs> I got to go. See? <laughs> um, so, there, you know, so we're, we're supposed to tread very lightly. And, and I think if you're involved in this discussion at all, in any context, you've sat in meetings and your butthole's clenched tight and you're like, oh, I don't know what to, if this is wrong or, 
right. I'm going to say the wrong thing. I can't pronounce this. I don't, I don't know. It's like danger. It's hard work. And what Elder Crochet is saying is like, the, the, it's way, that, that's hard, yes, but it's a distraction. It's way harder to rebuild your community, way harder to return to vibrant, healthy, well, and just communities. It's way harder for us to focus on ourselves than it is for us to focus on them. And it felt really dangerous to publish. And, and not because I don't believe him, I do believe him, but I had never really heard it proposed in this way before. And so if there's one thing, if I can give you homework, you all have to email me and let me know you did this. Um, <laughs> go back, I, inv I invite you to listen to it just as an offer uh, to you. I think it's very rewarding um, work that he put into that, that, uh, that keynote. Um, <coughs> I want to kind of stop going through this list and just kind of bring it back to a couple of different things that I think are really important. It's clear to me that if, if we are going to talk about reconciliation in Canada, we have to look at who's in the room. And you can go to essentially any reconciliation, reconciliation space across Canada any given day of the week, and you will always find absent uh, two things. Um, residential school survivors themselves, always absent. And you will find that Indigenous women and Two-Spirit people, generally, absent as well. And we have to look at why that is. And I'm saying that as a straight, able-bodied, university-educated, privileged person. I, I, I realize that it's kind of fucked up that I'm like, we need to center Indigenous women, man up here to say. I get it. But we have to look at why that, you know, why that is, and how important it is that if we are going to make space and time for this reconciliation project that we look at who's in the room. And, I, and for me, like there's no reconciliation if we're not centering these voices. Because these are the voices that have been most negatively impacted by the project. These are the voices that have suffered the greatest at the hands of this colonial project. And so if we're not listening to indigenous women and two-spirit people uh, through this effort of reconciliation, uh, we're doing it wrong. And that for me is fundamental there's no negotiation, there's no, there's no way around it. Um, we have to listen to these experiences and we know why. There's a na national inquiry right now um, in Canada that's letting us know why. And so we, we have a lot of work to do to ensure that whatever space we're building is a space that, that center, not only just centers indigenous voices but these voices specifically because we're very, we're very comfortable at like thinking about reconciliation in a way that like it's it, it has to be convenient right can't be too hard can't be too hard I get asked a lot to look at territorial acknowledgments and like can you talk to I'm like hey did you talk to your neighbors do you know who you live beside who are they what's their what is their story university <laughs> dean who are what, you know <laughs> did you call them did you make a ca phone call no Okay, you have, you, know, you have work to do. We have to think about, like, we have to think about, like, if we're actually going to do this work, how difficult it should be. Because what we're talking about is, like, completely reframing this, like, completely shifting the reality in this country. We're not talking about, like, not being mean to brown people. Like, that's, ne that's not reconciliation. Also, too, the liberal government doing the bare minimum right now and, and disguising it under this reconciliation discourse is complete and utter bullshit. Oh, are you attacking the drinking water problem? Well, fucking congratulations. You're 150 years late. Like, I'm not going to celebrate the liberal government for doing the bare minimum, for doing what they always should have done. I'm not going to celebrate any government that is, is just, just fixing the foundation. Because that's not what we have to expect way more out of this country than the bare minimum. Than fixing what is wrong. Right? And so we have to look at who, who like who's in the space, who's talking about this. You know, 
We're going to get some aboriginalists that are going to be the good Indians are going to collect their check and make everyone feel good at the end of the day, and those good aboriginals are everywhere. But if it feels too easy, you're being bullshitted, because it should be really hard. This project, at its core, is really difficult. Because if we're talking about making a more ethical and just place, we have, to, we have to redistribute the wealth in this country. We have to look at how indigenous nations are supported. Right? Montreal's not going anywhere. So what is, what is the Quebec? Well, I know what the Quebec response is to Ganawage. But we have to investigate all of these things. We have to make those relationships right. And that's really hard work. That's really hard work. And we're really good at privileging certain voices. We're really good at privileging certain voices. And we're comfortable with allowing certain voices in the room. And we're really comfortable with, with you know, picking faves and kind of just sticking with them. And we've seen this play out a number of diff different times with a number of different people. And I'll use one example that, that, uh, that I have um, a personal connection to, and that's, that's Joseph Boyden. And when Boyden is privileged over indigenous women um, and is now like a, a mouthpiece for the missing and murdered indigenous women movement and ha has Justin Trudeau's personal phone number and can call the prime minister, but he can't answer back, you know, where, who are, where are you from? You can't answer a fundamental question. That, that's, a, that's a problem. But why are non-indigenous people, why is Canada comfor so comfortable with people like Boyden's voice. Why is that so comfortable to us? It's, you know, it's a non-threatening voice. It's, it's a voice that is not rooted in community. It's, not, it's a voice that is not rooted in a lived reality. It's a voice that, that is disconnected from the truth. And so it's, it's easy. And we saw the same thing play out respectfully with, with the final efforts of Gord Downey. And there is, a, uh, we talked about this last night at dinner. I, I cry when I think about Gord Downey, uh, the musician, the, the person, uh, the good work that he did at the end of his life. I, 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 I have profound respect for what he did. But we have to really think about why it was so easy for the country to go, yep, yeah, I agree, yep, Chani Wenjack, secret, pa yep, secret path. I'm on a secret path now too. I'm in, <laughs> right? Best selling book. I mean, we just, we just, we just consume it, and, and it's pretty easy. But Gord Downey had the chance to go, oh, okay, yeah, well, Secret Path and Shawnee Wenjack, and I, I'm going I'm to uh, put, put together this TV special, and, and now a movie. And now the, the Downey Fund, you know, had f was given $5 million in the past federal budget for indigenous education. But at the start of this, Gord Downey had the chance to go like, oh, shit, let me hit Google and then just Google it. If you Google Chani Wenjack's name, there's a whole bunch of, now there's a whole bunch of stuff that, that will come up. But <coughs> Gord Downey had the chance to amplify the voice of somebody that already wrote a song about Chani Wenjack in 1970. And Gord Downey, through no fault of his own, goes through this transformative process for himself in his own life, championing this really good cause, reconciliation, creating uh, a movement and an understanding around uh, the time that we're in, in his final days. That's a, that's a, that's a pretty damn special project. But we missed an opportunity for Gord Downey to go, this is my space that I have, I'm going to give it to indigenous people, uh, instead of keeping himself at the center. And what would have been different had he given that space to indigenous people? Would Canada have responded the same way? I doubt it. So we have to be careful about the voices that, that we center, and if it feels too easy, it is. And I just wanna, I just wanna f f flag that. Because many episodes through through 21 episodes of the podcast, the, a lot of the conversations in, in the podcast were very difficult 
And that's, that's how I knew I was onto something that was important for me. And that my learning was, was at, at that time, um, was, was it was profoundly impacting me, listening to people talk about reconciliation. It was very, still is very, uh, very uncomfortable. There's this, there's this sense of, in, in reconciliation, there's a sense of like um, movement, that, that we're moving forward, that, that through this project we're going into this brand new, this time, this, this new era, and that it's happening you know, in real time uh, every, every single day with the decisions um, that we make. And, 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 and as I was saying, there's no blueprint to, to this work. And so if we are thinking about, well, we're, we're moving this country forward or, or we, have a, we have a chance to, to, to do better, um, we, ha we have to think about why. We have to think about, well, why, why are we doing this? We're not, we're, we're like, we're doing it because we're like, it sounds good, right? It's like it's the right thing to do. It's, yeah, it's, it's, we should do this. We should do better in this country. But we have to, we have to ask why. And I, I liken reconciliation to um, like a bag of puppies. You, and if you've been to the res or grew up on the res, you you've know what I'm talking about, the bag of puppies. Sometimes it's a bag of kittens, sometimes it's a bag of puppies. But you, f you find them in the ditch. You're like, oh fuck, who threw a bag of puppies in the ditch? <laughs> it's just because like your dog has puppies and you're like, nope, fuck this, that's too much work. And you just send then someone else has to pick up the puppies. And I think about reconciliation as the bag of puppies that showed up on our doorstep. And, uh, and we can't just throw it out. We can't go, well, fuck this, <laughs> that's too hard. You're, you're making the decision to pick up the bag of puppies and feed the puppies and love the puppies and nurture the puppies. And, and why, why, why are we doing this right now? Like, why are we doing this in this country? Well, because the statistics and the data and everything that, that we know to be true in this country is, is alarming. So that, that's one reason. But, uh, but that, that's, to me, is not, is not personal enough. And so for me, I, I start to ask that through um, Rebuilding Community episode, The Sugarbush Family, um, and, and a couple of other episodes. What, is it, what does it mean to, to en engage in this work? And I started to think about children, kids. Because at the core of the problem well, was the residential school system, indigenous children. Is there ever, can you think of a more cowardly act on the planet than specifically targeting kids? Is there a more cowardly act? And I heard Justice Sinclair talk one time saying, imagine going into an indigenous community when all of the kids are gone to schools and there's no laughter, there's no kids playing. Uh, you might have heard him say this. He said that to me and I, 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 I'll never be able to shake that, the, the, the image or the, the thought. So is there anything more cowardly? And I, to me, to me in, in, you know, in my view, there's not. There's just nothing more cowardly than targeting, specifically targeting children. And so children should be at the center of, of what we're doing. And that, start, that theme starts to emerge uh, through, through many different episodes of the podcast. But for me, uh, personally, I start to think more about, about my children, right? And then the question of like, well, how much, so what is this work about? Well, for me, yeah, it's about family and, and, and children. Um, but we have to make a decision. How much, of this, how much of this stuff are we giving to young people? and how much of it can we carry ourselves. So for every indigenous parent in this room, you've probably thought about this or had this conversation with your partner. How much do we have to tell our kids? How much do we have to burden our children with the weight of what is behind us in order to move forward? And that's a question I grapple with every day. And in my family, I'll use my own personal story, my family, before my grandmother died in 2007, she didn't get to see the apology. And she would have been pissed off. She was uh, like an old school Anishinaabe ninja. <laughs> <laughs> like the best hunter I've ever met. The, the strongest woman, the funniest, most angry. You know like you've seen these elders, they just look pissed off all the time. <laughs> that's that my cook'em. 
I, I think they call it, now they call it, what they call it, you see that sketch, resting, resting bitch face or whatever? <laughs> you know that, like, just that, that was her, just a permanent scowl. She would have rejected, she would have rejected the apology outright, I know that. But before she died, she, she told me, front to back, she told me about the day she got picked up to go to school, and she told me her entire story. She gave it to me. And it was, re it's, it's, it was really hard at the time. What I didn't know was that she wasn't going to tell anyone else, that she just, she gave it to me. And what I've had to do is even consider what I'm, what I share with my mom, because my mom thinks she knows my grandmother's story, and she doesn't. She doesn't. And so I have, so, so when we carry these stories and we carry the responsibility of this work, we have to be very careful about what we give to other people. And this is a big question in the reconciliation space right now, especially as it pertains to youth, and it came up in, in the 4 Arts Youth episode, is how much are we willing to give to non-Indigenous youth? Because it's not their fault. They're not to blame. But they have to understand it, right? They have to wrestle with these questions. That this, is their, this is forever now. Like our children, your children, your grandchildren, ch the children that are yet to come, that will bless us all in this room, this is their project forever. We have to think about that. This is forever now. This is Canada's project. And Canada can still say, nah, we're good. <laughs> we're good. Like Canada doesn't need to reconcile. They don't need to. They would be completely fine if they didn't. The economy would clip along at a stubborn, shitty pace. <laughs> Canadians would still watch Don Cherry on Saturday. Generally speaking, we're very comfortable in this country. We know where our next meal is coming from, mostly. There's a level of apathy, but we don't vote. We give a f eh. We know it's going to be the liberals or the conservatives. The NDP can't get their shit together. We don't, <laughs> we don't give a fuck. We're fine here. So this country doesn't need to do this. It doesn't need to engage in this work. So we ask, uh, we ask ourselves, well, why are, we, why are we in this room? Why are we engaging in this? And for me, it's the children. It's the kids. It's the more work that we choose to do, the more of the weight that we choose to carry, the less the weight will be on our children. And I think that's really important. I'm the first generation in my family that didn't go to residential school. Me. And so I have big, <laughs> round, chubby shoulders. I, I'll, I'll carry that. I'll carry that weight. And I have to be very careful about what I'm giving to my children. What am I giving to them to carry. And I think that that's a really important consideration in a lot of different ways. What are we giving to non-Indigenous Canadians to carry? And how much of that weight and burden is yours to carry? How much of that weight and burden is ours to carry in Indigenous communities? And what do we do with that weight and burden? And I think that that's a really, really important consideration that was flagged for me many times uh, throughout, um, throughout the, the, the season. Last thing I, I want to touch on before we open it up for questions and comments, is um, <coughs> when we joke about like, I, 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 I always joke about land, land over everything, land, just give us our land back, land, land, land. And, and I think it is a politically, fundamentally, there's no question, land has to be at the center, land and territory, water, um, where we live, that has to, we, that we have to center that. And there's no doubt, and we don't have enough time to really get into that. But I actually saw this, why it was important. I saw it play out here in this episode um, in Nipissing First Nation. And um, we brought together uh, youth and elders um, to uh, talk about Lake Nipissing. Lake Nipissing is, is, uh, was considered a dead lake just a couple of years ago. Um, the fish stocks and the fish, po fish population drastically reduced. There's scientists from all over the world studying Lake Nipissing to find out what the hell's going on there. And uh, a couple of different things are happening. There's, there's a huge tourism industry uh, in North Bay. That, f that lake is fished every day of the week, every year, uh, every month. There's just always people fishing it. There's sports fishing in the winter. There's like a little city that is built out there. They sell hot dogs and beers, and it's, it's, it's like a redneck utopia. <laughs> um, and it never stops. And the First Nation um, 
one of their, their sources of own source revenue is their commercial fishery. And so we're getting into a situation um, in Nipissing where the local First Nation uh, people are out there overfishing, right, to provide money for their family, it's their jobs. Um, they're overfishing the lake and the tourists are coming, buying licenses from the province to fish the lake. Um, commercial fishermen are also out there, licensed by the province to fish the lake, and there's this huge clash. And so the community um, uh, brought me in there to facilitate a storytelling project with, with youth and elders to talk about the lake and why it was important in an effort to just, just sort of remember how important and fundamental that lake is to their existence. And uh, so I spent a, a week in the community. And day one, uh, we decide, well, well, we'll start with the elders and uh, I'll bring gifts and seek permission to be there and, and to do that work. And so I, I meet the protocol, I, I give out the tobacco and do everything that I have to do to, to even be allowed to be there. And then I go, well, let's, let's tell some stories about the lake, who's, you know, who's got a memory. And ev just unanimously, the elders are like, I don't know anything. I don't know. Can we go? This, when's the bus coming back, you know? <laughs> And I'm like, well, no, we, like, we, uh, we're looking for stories. Any story, any, any story will do. And, uh, and we're sitting in a, in like in a, a conference room, you know, um, and no one's really, and I'm not the best facilitator, but I'm not shitty at my job. I'm, I'm decent enough that I can get a good conversation ripping around a room. Nothing, nothing. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, either these people hate me or they just really think this project sucks. I don't know what to do. Um, and then a woman, uh, one of the elderly ladies, she says, oh, well, let's go outside and get some fresh air. We'll take a break and we'll come back. Says so we did. And where do we end up? On the shores of the lake. Mm -hmm. So we're outside. And it's there where one old guy goes, you see that island out there? I said, yeah. He says, yeah, they call it Thunderbird Island. I'm like, fuck, this is a story. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? You know all these stories. He's like, yeah, but you know, <laughs> the light bulb goes on. You, we, we have to be on the land. We have to be on the, what the hell are we doing in a conference room? We have to be on the land telling stories. And it transforms everything. We stay outside. We, we bring the snacks and the, the, the fruit and everything out for the elders. We stay outside and we, we spend the day outside. And stories galore. By the end of it, I mean, we put up a map of the lake. It was probably the size of these two boards. There was just sticky notes all over, mapping the location of old fishing camps and, and village sites and different things. And many of the, it, you, you, you get one person going, oh yeah, wasn't it so-and-so that was at so-and-so? Yeah, and then boom, and we start just building this complete community history in, in one afternoon. Hundreds of sticky notes. The youth come in the next day, and they look at that, and I said, well, on the back of the sticky note is the short sort of 100 word version of this story. And what I would like you to do is pick two or three of them um, to think about and, and you'll be matched up with that elder and we'll tell each other these stories in day, in day four, five, and six of, of the workshop. Same thing, no one's really motivated. I'm like, ha ha, I learned the trick. Let's go outside, let's go outside. <laughs> So we do one better, we get some boats, we get a couple of big pontoon boats and we take the youth out there. And, and at that point, I had acquired this, these stories and I said, you guys need to really understand like, how rich you are here with this, this, this history. And the youth never really consider, I mean, they go swim in the lake, they, you know, some of them go fishing, but some don't. Uh, and it's really, really beautiful. They all select their stories. Day three and four, the elders and the youth are paired together and they start uh, telling each other these stories. And what starts happening is that the youth start to understand uh, their place in the community because we're using the indigenous place names of the lake, we're using Anishinaabemwin to use, to use those place names as, as, as teaching tools and why they are called certain things. And the youth have, we're, we're s I've never experienced it where I could feel the pride of the young people just, just emanating out of them, where they were actually, they learned something. It wasn't like, oh, I did, this is great, I have to be here because my parents made me come here. Like, they were excited and happy to be there. And, and 
the word remember is, is, is a word that I, just, I love so much. And, so, and, and old man, I, I wish I knew his name. I wish I could tell you who it was. He came up to me after a talk one time. Um, and he said, I want you to think about the word remember. And I said, yeah. And he said, uh, just tell me what that word means. And I said, well, it's, you know, it's to recall. And I'm like, you know, trying to come up with the definition for him. I'm like, well, it's to rem remember through, <laughs> <laughs> through memory, remembering memories, and then telling, sharing the memory by remembering. And uh, he's like, nope. But also, <laughs> um, he, he, he did this. He was like, separate the word, remember. When you are telling stories to each other, you are bringing your, your people back to the circle. You are remembering your community. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I felt high and I wasn't. I was like, whoa. And then he just turned and walked away. He's like, see you later. <laughs> and I was like, come back. I want to buy you dinner. We have to talk about this word. We have to talk about this word. And, and to remember is, is, for me, for my money, for the reconciliation work that, that I want to do, I want to remember. I want to continue to center these stories so as to put our, our, these circles back together and, and think about how we remember our communities and, and, and consider the stories we tell ourselves. Because the stories we tell ourselves, we often speak in this deficient language. We lost our language, we lost our culture, we lost our ways, we lost... And that deficient language is not just self-defeating, it, it, it becomes the truth. And so we don't have to talk about how important representations in media are or have the mascot debate or anything like that, but representations and the stories therein are massively important. And so we have to remember, we have to center our voices and our stories in this project if we are going to rebuild our communities to bring them back to whole again. And storytelling to me is such a beautiful, beautiful offer. It's a doorway that allows people to walk through and on the other side of the doorway they discover this, this world, this experience. And they hear voices and stories that they may, may not have had access to before. And it's them up, to, up to them to stay in that room and to find the other stories in the room, or to walk out, close the door behind them, and never go back in. But for me, indigenous storytelling, film, media, podcasting, music, art, the, the, these doorways that are being built right now are some of the most generous, beautiful uh, doorways imaginable. And so I invite Canadians to just continue to walk through these doorways, continue listening to indigenous people. Stop fucking talking. I'm sorry about your feelings. It's really heavy to learn about this shit. I'm sorry you're crying. But you have to hear these stories. You have to hear these voices. They will make your life better. They will improve this country. They will fundamentally shift. Finding Cleo, Connie Walker's work in her podcast series. It's a story about a family and this girl that goes missing, but it, 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 it takes apart the 60s scoop in a way that if you listen to that and you still are telling me to get over it, you're a fucking asshole. You have access to, pers to perspectives and experiences that are just will fundamentally change your life. They will change the way you see this country and that's what we need. We can't stay safe behind our privilege, behind, but behind our own little safety net, our inheritance. And, and, and there's a massive inheritance that Canada has benefited from for the last 150 years. And, and we have to look at that inheritance and start getting uncomfortable. To, to kind of be cheap about it, we have to unsettle the settler. It's not my word, don't be mad at me. <laughs> people get mad at that word. <laughs> Fuck you, don't, I didn't settle nothing. Well, your people called yourselves that. <laughs> Fucking, don't yell at me, it's your word. So centering Indigenous voices, remembering, for me, is the project. That's the project. And by, not, by Gord Downey not mentioning the name Willie Dunn, who, Willie Dunn wrote that song in 1970. He's the, he's, he made the first music video in North America through the National Film Board. 
Willie Dunn is a Mi'kmaq singer-songwriter that should have been celebrated through the secret path, Chani Wenjack Proctor. You never heard that name once from Gord Downey. Why didn't we center Willie Dunn? Would, have, would Canadians have responded the same way if Mi'kmaq people went, you know what, our guy, Willie Dunn, wrote this song, and now you're going to hear his family's perspective, his son's perspective on his father writing this song. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't have accessed it. We would have rolled our eyes, we would have changed the channel, we would have clicked off, we wouldn't have shared it on Facebook, but we're comfortable. We're comfortable privileging certain voices, and that's a problem. I'm going to close. We're very close to the end. I know we're at 7.30. I apologize. I, I talk too much. <laughs> in, re, uh, in remembering and using the circle sort of as, as the metaphor for our, our lives, our, our, our families, our, our communities, our nations, we understand that in this circle, you know, we all have a place in the circle. We all have responsibility back to the circle. That's what our, uh, our lives are about, is about taking your space in the circle and contributing back to community and having that circle take care of you. And when you have holes in the circle and people go missing and die and are murdered and are scooped and are taken, you have these very broken, fractured circles. And to put the circles back together, for me, is uh, is what reconciliation is. It's not about Trudeau, it's not about programs or services, it's about us rebuilding, remembering, and rebuilding those circles, putting them back together. And there's a lot of different ways to do it, and there's no one right way, or, or, and there's no wrong way. But this is, um, these are pictures from Fort Albany in uh, Pitabic, um, where I was invited with uh, three other people to be a part of uh, uh, creating a program for the community, a, a youth leadership program for the community after a string of uh, suicides. And there had been uh, five suicides in four months. And um, it was a very, very, very intense time in the community. And, um, and we were asked to come there to, to develop some sort of leadership program that, that could be in response to what was happening, but also perhaps grow into some sort of council that, that focus on health and wellness for, for young people. But young people aren't necessarily unhealthy or unwell. Uh, they're not at risk. We label young people. They're at risk, youth at risk. I was a youth at risk. Youth at risk, well, of, uh, at, r at risk of what? Fucking colonialism? Like, <laughs> let's name it. I'm not at risk of myself. We're at risk of the system, of the country, of the project. That's what we're at risk of. And so we start to flag these things inside of Pitabic, like what, what, is, what, is, what, what, what is happening with these young people? And we, this is the first morning, and we start putting these sticky notes up, and we're just listing bullying, violence, fighting, you know, all of, all of the symptoms of, of colonialism, colonization, the ongoing effects. And, uh, and pretty soon <coughs> after, after the, the first day, this entire wall, every, the whole wall is covered with, with you know, all of the problems. And it's a really intense day. And this is Edward Matatawabin, who, uh, who came in uh, to close the circle. And he's a residential school survivor himself. And he asked all the youth to please come back the next day. He said, please come back tomorrow. We need every single one of you. And he did it in a way that, that um, was really illuminating for me, making eye contact with every single young person saying, I need you back here, I, we need you back here tomorrow, you are important to this circle. And we started working, everything we did, we started working in this circle. And by the end of day two, the walls were filled with solutions and ideas and responses to all of the problems, right? And so we work our way into kind of thinking about, well, how can we, how can we fix what's happening? What, what is it that we need? And at the end of day two, we have a big team meeting, and uh, the chief and council come in in the meeting, and they announce that they've managed to raise $380,000. De Beers, the Diamond Mine, and a, and a few other corporations have kicked in close to $400,000 to, 
to fund whatever this thing is that we create f uh, with the community and with the youth. But that we're not to tell, he said, don't tell the young people that there's a budget. <laughs> don't do it. Just do the work and in the final report, price this thing out and let us know what we have to do. So, so we're working from that premise that there is a budget that we can probably do something for these, these, these young people uh, in this way. But through the process, something really interesting happens. And we're not telling them about the budget, but we are having a conversation about, well, what do you want to happen in your community? And, and, and how uh, I choose to, to run programming and how I create the leadership model is, is it's fundamentally centering the land. And I use the seasons. And, and you program around the seasons. And, and that's the way I like to, to try to run it. But me being a dummy, I'm like, so we're going to use the four seasons, okay? Uh, we're in the four seasons, they're looking at me all funny because they have six seasons up there, and I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> the freeze up and the melt are like fundamental to life in the north, right? It's like the core of the existence is this, the freeze up and the melt. So I learned something, so now we're talking about the six seasons. Okay, so we got a program around the six seasons. How are we going to do that? And if you can read some of these things, these aren't trips to Toronto or to the West Edmonton Mall, uh, or a Raptors game, or anything like that. This says Goose Camp. They just want to go to Goose Camp, because all their uncles go to Goose Camp. And they want teepee teachings, and, and they want to snare rabbits. Um, they want food teachings. This all came from them. This, this all came from them. And so we started to look at, well, what is the uh, how, you know, how do we put this together with a budget and everything? And we, we work through our, our 10 days in the community. And we start to look at, well, and we put together this map for the community and we price it out. And it's less that we, we price out the materials, like the good materials, at around $45,000. And we submit it. And we go, well, here's your final report. Thanks. And we, we go home. A couple days later, we get a call from chief and council. They're livid. They're like, but you didn't spend the money. You didn't do the work. We paid you to submit this shit. You didn't spend the money. It was like, they don't want money. They don't want money. They want your time. Read the report. That's all these young people wanted. They want time. They want to be with the elders in the bush. They want to go to goose camp. That doesn't fucking cost you anything. You're already going. Take a kid with you. They didn't want PlayStations and new TVs and iPads. They wanted time. And that's a resource that money doesn't buy. And I started my, my comments today saying that, 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 that time and the space that we make for each other is fundamental to the work that we need to do. We have to make the time to do this work. And we have to make the space to do this work. And all these young people wanted, un almost unanimously, was time from the adults in their lives. And that, for me, really frames the whole conversation around family. Family is the revolution. Family is what reconciliation is about. It's not, a pr I don't, it, it's not about them or us. It's about rebuilding indigenous families, being free, you know, to work on indi the indigenous liberation project in this country. Anything short of full indigenous liberation inside of Canada is not good enough. Our families should be free to work on that project. We, we shouldn't have to worry about our daughters, our aunties. We shouldn't have, we, but we do. We said it today. My white friend, he woke up and he's like, yeah, I'm not sure where we're going, golfing, you know. So, oh, fuck, that's great. We wake up every morning and check Facebook to see who died. Did someone die last night? Is someone missing? Did they find so-and-so? That's our reality. And until we're free f of that reality in this country, until everyone is safe, no one is safe. And how do we move forward? How do we reconcile with that? How do we, we embrace each other and round dance in the streets? You know, there's, there's huge, huge, huge... There's a, lo well, there's a lot at stake for Canada. The, the, the world's watching what's going on here. And that's why in the media, front-facing, like we're all smiling, and that's what's so hurtful about the AFN and Perry Bellegarde, just, 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 just co-signing all of this bullshit without talking to the people in the communities, is that because the political implications of this project are massive. 
There's a lot riding on this for Canada. And so front facing, we're <laughs> smiling. Carolyn Bennett's got her fucking scarf on. She's just <laughs> <laughs> everything's good. That's why we need to continue dis to disrupt. We need to continue to, to demand more from this project because the bare minimum and programs and services will not help. We've seen programs and services across communities be cut just, just like that with new governments. They go, nope, not that, not that, not that. It happened inside the National Friendship Center movement. Core funding is cut from it. I mean, we could make a long list of the reason why programs and services are not the answer. And so for me, quite clearly, family is the movement. And when we center families, and we, we start to look at how we bring ourselves back to whole, there's a couple of fundamental pieces that have to accompany that. Land is at the center of my health and well-being. It gives me everything I need to be well. Medicine, food, water. And so we have to live in good relationship. Inakanagewin is, is a law concept. It's an Anishinaabe law concept. But when you translate this word, it's not, talk, it's not literally translated to law. What it's actually talking about is your relationship to all things that are, that will be, and that were. And so it's actually talking about your reciprocal relationship to the world around you. So when you live in good spirit, when you're able to live in good spirit in connection to Aki, land, you're centering and you're focused on that reciprocal relationship back to all that keeps you well. We have to be free to do that. We have to be free to do that in this country. And so, for, for, for me, this is why land is fundamental to the family project. We have to be able to bring our children out to teach them the language, to show them the medicines, to talk about where we come from in a free and unencumbered way, without private property signs, without being shot on farms without being worried about being yelled at by our neighbors. We have to be free in our territory. We ha we have and, 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 and I say that kind of thinking about not, not, just, not just sort of the, the current context, but like what we do in the future. Like what we do in the future in, in Canada is, is so important in terms of land. And we're starting to see land being returned to indigenous people. We're starting to see those that are, are well off enough with their inheritance to give their summer homes up. I always say that, there's all oh, reconciliation, and people go, yeah, woohoo!" and then I go, give me the keys to your summer house, <laughs> just for the month of August, just, <laughs> but then they're like, no, well, no, no, what? <laughs> so it's gonna be, a, it has to be uncomfortable, it has to be uncomfortable, and indigenous voices need to be centered. We need to remember, we need to make time, we need to make space, and, and we have to really consider who's in the room. And we have to be very careful about the way we proceed because we're not going to get a do-over, right? We're not going to get a do-over. So thank you very much for coming tonight, Miigwech. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
And what they do is they, there's the food and the cultures and the languages and the, the money and the architecture and the selfies now and uh, all of the great things that happen when you get to go out and, and travel the world. And, and we have no problem thinking about the EU as a thing with, with diverse cultures and languages and foods and laws and histories. We have no problem with that. We love it. Uh, but we don't think about Canada the same way that these kids could do the same thing, catch a train from Vancouver and head out to Halifax on the train and experience the same thing. They could experience the same sort of diversity inside of indigenous communities. We have our own laws, foods, cultures, languages, ceremonies, types of architecture. We have our, we, we, if we were free to live that way, they could s discover the same type of diversity right here in this country. But we have a problem thinking about indigenous nations in this country being separate from this colonial state. And b by the way, my answer informs you, I am far f from a political scientist, so I'm talking out of my ass a little bit, <laughs> but that's, that's what I think about, is like what, what nationhood actually looks like and, and how, how it will and can transform territory in s such a profound way um, for the better. In, in in a really beautiful way, and so I'm not a fan of borders. I don't think you know having borders is necessarily the answer, and I, I'm not quite sure how we get there. But yeah, f full indigenous liberation in our homelands is, and nothing short of it. So, yeah. Yes. It's really. Um, it's really great to see how you're laying your emphasis on the building on, on the social reproduction of different kinds of subjects and the building of family and social relations. Uh, Settler colonialism is also built on a certain form of capitalism. And it's not really possible to rebuild community when so many other different forces are pushing in. And you know, you were saying you got funding from De Beer Mining, right? To do an, an education. It wasn't my community. No, no, I might have went it. like, oh, well, save yeah. the check. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, mean, I understand, yeah. Cases, yeah. Maybe the only check coming too, so I don't know. Um, but I, want, I was wondering what your um, views are on thinking about the role of um, capitalism and any kind of alternative infrastructures and structures that would support this um, work of building the community or rebuilding the community. From yeah. Uh, well, we know, I mean, we know mm -hmm. Uh, indigenous peoples long had our own economies and and um, treaties amongst ourselves to trade and, and to move through each other's territories to, to do that and so we know it exists we and we know it's possible how we exist inside of capitalist state um, and returning to trade economy or some sort of mixed economy like that is is an interesting experiment but it's also happening um, Nim Nimki Ajbakong is, is, is an example um, where Christy Belcourt and, and Isaac Murdoch are, are actually creating that. Um, you don't pay money to go into the camp, you, you, you go there and you work and you fish and you provide uh, for yourselves and for others. And so there are, there are a couple of models where we can see uh, currently um, where, where this works. And, and yeah, cap I mean capitalism, in order for capitalism to work, it needs workers, and we all, we know the structure is is violent to, to, to women, and we we know that it do, it's not sustainable, and so we we do have to think outside of it. And this is where this is where land becomes, you know, s so important to, to to indigenous futures is because like we can't um, when we when we allow industry into our communities, you know, we you can't go back. Um, in, in Treaty 3, where I come from, um, you know, pulp and paper was the backbone of, of Treaty 3 for the last hundred years. Well, you know, the a iPad comes and people stop reading newspapers and pulp and paper industry t tanks and, and Dryden, Fort Francis, Kenora, Atacokan, Ear Falls, Gull Bay, Thunder Bay. These are, these are going to be ghost towns if, if something doesn't change for those communities. And, um, we're not brave enough yet to imagine something else different, um, but it happened overnight. Two thousand, pe almost two thousand people in Fort Francis, in my hometown, lost their jobs, and the Japanese corporation that bought the mill uh, two years prior 
overnight packed up their computers and bounced. It's like gone. And a few months later declared bankruptcy. And so, so the response to, for the town uh, was to open up a mine. So now New Gold, which is, if you know anything about mining worldwide, New Gold is a terrible corporation. Um, they allowed New Gold into the territory and because people need to work. And, you know, people lost their jobs inside of the mill and a Facebook group emerged called the, the Fort Francis Man Cave and it was former mill workers selling their trucks and snowmobiles that had liens and loans against them just to try to make ends, like they're breaking the law just to try to make ends meet. That's how desperate the situation was there. So when you allow these corporations and industry in your territory, it's really hard to go, go back, right? And so this country has a lot of self-examination that has to happen. And that's a reconciliation project in and of itself. And in one of the, one of the episodes of the podcast, I actually share a, a couple of stories about families that um, tried to hold out uh, from the tar sands uh, for a long time, but ended up making the decision to, to uh, get employment in, in the tar sands. Um, just for, for different reasons. So kind of investigate that through, through the podcast a little bit um, in, in a couple of the episodes of the podcast. And I think it's a big, a big question this country has to answer. Um, also shared, I was in the Northwest Territories um, uh, with my friend Denise and his family during 2015 at the end of the summer. Um, it was the worst forest fire season on record up there and uh, they put out all the fires above ground but they continue to burn underground and it burned through the telecommunication system and uh, they couldn't find where along the road where this had happened so there was no internet you know no gas because you know pay at the pump is convenient but it's connected to the internet um, no ATMs no internet uh, the banks don't work because they don't keep cash at banks I don't know if you know this if you have 20 grand in the bank, you can't walk in and go, give me my $21,000 bills. They go, well, sorry, we don't have that. We have to make an appointment. They have to order the cash. So all of our money is just ones and zeros. And in NWT, when this happened, there was six of us on tour and we had $44 cash. Um, you know, and we're like, well, <laughs> get a gun. We got to go hunt. Like, this is, I don't know what we're going to do. And, and, and we're on tour, and so we couldn't get gas. There, there's no money. Um, but what was really beautiful in Fort Smith when we were there is um, they just went back to a trade economy. And it lasted five days, and I got to witness it and be a part of it. And everyone took care of each other, and, and it was really beautiful. And at the risk of sounding like Farley Mowat, <laughs> it was like, oh, those northerners, you know. <laughs> you know what they call Farley Mowat up there? Hardly know it. <laughs> so, so it was really beautiful to witness and it, it, it does let me know that there's de there's we know how to take care of each other, um, but it's going to take us giving up a lot of our, our comforts, right? Um, in 2003, when my first daughter was born, um, uh, this was during SARS, if, I don't know if you remember SARS, um, but the SARS outbreak uh, was happening in my, we were in St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto uh, during SARS, and, and if you remember that summer, the, the whole eastern part of Ontario shut down because a, hi a, a hydro thing failed in Niagara Falls, and so Toronto was in the dark for four days. Well, let's just say Toronto <laughs> will not go back to a trade economy. <laughs> it will be the walking dead uh, incarnate. Like it, 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 because even just in the, th the three days without power in Toronto, um, you know, the first day is kind of fun. You barbecue with your neighbors and you bring out the beer that you have and everyone's like, well, okay, this is fun. Sleepover, you know. <laughs> and then day two is like, well, it's still kind of fun. By day three, you're out of food and you're kind of hooped. Right? Like, I don't know what, I don't know what, what we're going to do, there's, and, and the grocery stores only have two days of food in them. So once the grocery stores get cleared out, like it's, it's really dark. <laughs> but but we, have to, we have to do it. We have to think about it. And there's a question in, in, in Dave Corshane's keynote where he, he asked the question, if you can't feed the people, are you a nation? 
Whew. Fuck, stop it, you know? <laughs> so these are good, these are good, really important questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, say hello, thank you for the talk. Ah. Um, I can't, just by myself, because I'm one person, I don't have the funds to give back land, but you were saying at the end, they don't want your money, they want your time. Is my time still acceptable to give? You're here, yeah. Yeah, it's great. I mean, that, I mean um, showing up is, is a big part of it. Um, likes on Facebook are also sort of a part of it. Tw <laughs> tweets and retweets are sort of a part of it. But showing up is, 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 is really important. And bringing someone with you next time um, is, is really important, you know? Um, I think that's the best we can do right now. I, I don't expect, I don't expect, I don't expect anything out of anybody, and, and I, don't, I don't think most indigenous people don't. We're used to, we're, we're fine. We're, we're going to be okay. Um, but yeah, showing up is, is really important, and, and I think giving each other time and space is, is really fundamental to, to the conversation. And what you do afterwards becomes sort of your, your path and in, in your journey. And you know, I get emails all the time that are kind of funny, but it's like, hey, I, you know, I read Leanne Simpson and then I watched this YouTube video and then I called my uncle a fucking racist at Easter dinner. <laughs> like, oh. uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So it is happening and, and, and what's really, and I, you know, we're j kind of joking, but like everyone here is gonna have their own path on this this kind of journey and there really is no right or wrong way, you know, and, and it's, it's, that's the challenge. And it is difficult, and I don't mean to be dismissive, it is very hard work. And it's, it's and, and um, there's a sort of a saying that I've heard in, in many different spaces, people saying, strong hearts to the front. And so for those of us that have strong hearts, that, that hold strong hearts, come to the front of the line and lead, show us, do something, anything. Um, but when you get tired and when you get hurt, take a break and be good to yourself. Be kind to yourself. You know, um, this work burns you out, um, and and it will burn you out. It should. It's hard. It's heavy if you're doing it right. So we're calling. We're just calling the strong hearts to the front. We're asking people to take their privilege, to take their resources, their networks, their friends, their families to to do that work for themselves and. You know, you're seeing book clubs emerge. You're seeing, like, the 94 calls to action are, are being responded to slowly, but but people are coming around to it. So it's in all sectors and all spaces, and we all have work to do if we're going to engage in this way. So showing up is, I think, is a good, good, great step. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thanks for the the talk and the Hi. podcast, mm. which I started to listen to, and the question is more about the podcast. Um, which really felt intimate to me. Yeah. These conversations, I had never heard them before in other spaces. Yeah. And I was wondering, I was a bit surprised that you would say you came into the podcast with this political, very almost theoretical way to see things. Yeah. So mm, how would you explain this very intimate vibe? Mm. And honest, you said honest that one of the podcasts you were wondering if whether to share or not this type of conversation? Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, it's the worst name podcast. Red Man Laughing is like <laughs> the worst name. I rarely laugh on that <laughs> podcast. Um, <laughs> was it you last night saying you can rename it Red Man Crying? Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, what are friends for? <laughs> you know? um, but, but uh, yeah, it was, and, and it was a departure from the other work that I was doing, and so it, it, it is very intimate. I'm, my grandpa dies in, in season five of this podcast, and I'm talking about my family and reconciliation, and, and I watched my mom, who wasn't raised by her parents, um, you know, have to reconcile with her father on his deathbed. And, you know, um, and I, sh I share the, the story, and like, it's a miracle that, because of the trauma in my family, it's a miracle that, you know, my brother and my two sisters and I weren't 
scooped and taken from my parents because my parents were drug addicts and alcoholics. And so I put this together in an episode of the podcast and I record it all and I put it away and I'm like, well, fuck, I'm not publishing that, right? But then I think about it and I'm like, well, it's not that I don't want to be at the center of the work. I want to be involved in the work. I love the work. But I, I, didn't, I don't want to be at the center of it. But this whole season of the podcast is me at, at the center kind of wrestling with trying to answer these, these questions because I was so angry about, about the way things were happening. And so it is, a, it is a, a personal sort of reflection, but um, I, don't, you know, I don't know that I could do that again you know, in that way. So, so I th like for me, it was just a chance to just turn the microphone on and, and let it happen. So, um, yeah, so I don't know. I don't think I even answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the talk today. Yeah. I just wanted to add to what you're saying. It was uh, like the raw, and very real to the point where there are other people that are equally angry and they get to walk in your shoes mm. and then they feel their own shoes and then yeah. they can take those steps. So it's, even though it's probably particularly yours, I can imagine a whole bunch of oh, people yeah. just going, yeah, man, that's yeah. fucking right. Yeah. Or whatever it is that they're A lot of those emails. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> But they're going to move with you. They'll grow and learn and move on. To, yeah. Um, and it's just a. Great. It's well, I yeah. You I probably didn't think of it that way. But and I, I, I mean, I I appreciate you saying that, but I don't I don't think of it that way. It's I have a weird job, right? Artists to paint alone. <laughs> you know, go and like, they're they're alone. Writers go sit wherever they sit and and write. Like, and my job is is. I talk and I, I record things and I, so it's just a weird job. Um, and so, but what's, what I love the most about it is not the success of the show or whether it reaches certain download numbers, it's the, the emails. It's the people going like, you're just saying what I can't, but I think that way, so thanks. And it's like, yeah, no, not everyone talks for a living. So, so that's really cool. And then it builds this, this, this bond with people that I think is really special. And I, I started podcasting in 2008 when podcasting wasn't even really a technology yet. And I remember like the first episode of the thing that I published got like 11 downloads. And I was like, who are these 11 weirdos? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it was, and, and, but that was the drug for me. It was like episode two, 21. Who are these 20? Episode three, it was like 40 people. And I'm, I couldn't believe 40 people would find this little thing on the internet. And, and now, you know, it's, it's, it's grown to like 40 or 50,000, like an, an episode. And I, I don't know who these people are, but there's something there for them. And, and it's, it's finding ourselves in those stories that I think is just that generous offer. It's like when we access, when we watch a, uh, Rhymes for Young Ghouls, when we watch um, a Colonization Road, a d when, we, when we hear or feel these stories, we s that's what we like about it. We see ourselves reflected back at ourselves and and um, and so I th that that for me is the, the the bond and the the value of of having that bond through storytelling is so powerful yeah storytelling is the movement that really is yeah awesome I think that's a great place to stop thank, great. You, so thank you all yeah. thank you But also, <laughs> <laughs> subscribe to the podcast. Yeah. I'm the worst business person in the world. <laughs> subscribe to it, put it on your phone, and every time an episode drops, it gets sent to your phone. Thanks. That's it. <laughs> <laughs>